Welcome to the Water Channel Podcast, a series of conversations on water, food, agriculture, and environmental sustainability. We feature stories and insights that reflect our present and are shaping our future. This is Long One from Meta Meta. My pleasure to host our podcast of today. Pretty much every single city of the world faces one common challenge. The water demand is rising rapidly and cities are struggling to provide sufficient water to all different needs. Drinking water, water for nature, water for agricultural crops, for industries, etc. In view of increasingly severe water shortage caused by population growth, economic developments and climate change, securing water supply is currently a top priority when it comes to urban water management. What factors are driving water shortage in cities? Which solutions are available to address this challenge? These are pressing questions for many cities, all the way from London, Cairo, Baira, New Delhi to Bangkok and many more. In this episode, we will talk about water supply for cities in the Global South. It is my great pleasure to welcome our featured guest, Dr. Janice Susnik from IHE Delft Institute for Water Education. Dr. Janice is a senior lecturer and researcher in water resources management. Amongst other themes, Janice has a strong interest and research portfolio on urban water demand and supply. Thank you very much, Janice, for joining our podcast. It is great to have you here on the Water Channel. I would like to start off our conversation with a rather surprising fact about water shortage in cities. Some of your research suggested that while climate change definitely plays a role, it is perhaps not the most important challenge. Can you please elaborate on this? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, a lot of... um... Like you mentioned, a lot of recent research has has suggested that you know climate change is is one of and it is one of the biggest factors we've got to deal with. But I think if you specifically look at cities and especially rapidly developing sit, uh, cities across the world, we've done work that has started to suggest that it's possibly population growth and the explosion in urban population growth that will actually drive future water scarcity and be the main driver of water scarcity rather than climate change. Climate change will, of course, have an impact, but we're suggesting that it's actually this explosive growth in population leading to a huge um, population water demand that will drive water scarcity for a lot of urban areas around the world. That's what some of our research has started to suggest. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. And, and, and just to put things in perspective in terms of the magnitude of the impact on water scarcity, um, what kind of order of magnitude are we talking about? For example, climate change is going to contribute to this much percent. On the other side of the equation, you have population explosion that will lead to a certain percentage of, of the problem. Do we have such an observation in certain cities that you have been working in? Well, we've done an analysis on 12 mega cities around the world. So these are cities with a population more than 10 million um, inhabitants. And there's 35 or so mega cities. We've analyzed 12 of these. Um, and so, you know, that's just a small fraction of the total mega cities. And that, didn't, that analysis didn't include cities less than 10 million or these rapidly up and coming cities in Asia and particularly also in Africa as well. Um, so, the, yeah, I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of people, perhaps, uh, perhaps even more. Um, facing water scarcity and there's other research that kind of backs up these numbers as well so yeah it's quite a pressing issue interesting and i think it's also quite counterintuitive when you think about it it is counterintuitive with all the climate debate that's going on i mean i'm i take that very se- uh, seriously of course but i think this kind of population explosion this urban population explosion and the impact of that on the security of water supply has been p- p- potentially overlooked um, as a driving factor in uh, in urban areas, which of course is now um, where most people live. Yeah, and the tendency is, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, there's a very strong trend that in the future more people will concentrate in the city, right? That's what most of the projections are showing, yeah. I mean, the UN is, are suggesting, so we currently have about 52, 53% of the global population living in urban centres. And we're expecting by about 2050, that population rising to 70%. And then if you put that in context of the total population, so we currently have about three and a half, 
to 3.7 billion people living in urban centers out of a population of seven and a half billion. By 2050, if, as, if, if we do hit 10 billion people, then 70% of that means 7 billion in cities. So that means our entire current global population just in cities. And then that, that's the challenge to be met is we need, is all these people need to be supplied with um, safe drinking water. Um, and then the question arises, where do you get that water? With a lot of cities already facing stress, um, you know, Cape Town and Chennai um, are the two obvious examples, but um, there are others. Yeah. And, and, and are these city part of the portfolio of the cities that you took into account in the project uh, that you have? So in the 12 mega cities, no, um, but we had another project which looked at smaller cities and there, there we looked at specifically, we looked at Surabaya um, in Indonesia and also Gresik, which is also in Indonesia. We looked at Maputo and Baira in Mozambique. And then we also had students looking at, for example, Accra in Ghana, Lilongwe in um, Malawi, Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. And um, yeah, it was a similar kind of finding that for most of these cities, the demand is currently either outstripping the supply or is pushing to the limits of existing supplies. Um, so it's, it's not just uh, we found this finding in mega cities, we also found it in smaller cities as well of a few tens to a few hundred fa uh, thousand in individuals. I think it's, it's, it's very interesting and, and, and at the same time impressive to see that you have such a nice coverage of cities. Could you perhaps explain what was the motivation in the in the project team to cover these cities and what was the beauty of it yeah well i mean obviously the beauty is in the diversity so um we had this huge array of cities from across across the planet um and what was also interesting is a lot of the challenges and 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 uh, barriers being faced were common amongst the cities so that was also we obviously had the specific um things to deal with but there were also a lot of commonality so that was part of the really interesting studying piece in terms of the motivation um yeah we got um funding from the dupc um two framework program which is a cooperation between ihe delft and the dutch ministry um and we wanted to look into this issue of water supply to cities and how we could perhaps alleviate some of the concerns so Gresik and Surabaya and Maputo and Beira were the original four cities. Um, but also here at IHE, we're lucky to have a, a very diverse student population. And um, some of the students for the MSc research were interested in, in doing, doing a similar approach for their home cities. So that's where we brought in cities like Accra, like Lilongwe, like Sharm El Sheikh, which just added to the diversity and contributed to the research. Could you give an overview or an explanation of what are causing scarcity of water in urban, particularly from the context of urban south? So fundamentally, it's kind of a balance between how much you have and how much you need. So on the supply side, I mean, some cities are just water scarce. They're just the supply is very low. So then you're thinking cities like. Uh, um, wind in, in Namibia. It's just it's situated in a region with very low water resources. Um, so that's one side of the problem is, is how much do you actually have? And then the other side is, well, how much do you need? So that's where the demand comes in and that's where this link to population explosion is particularly important. Um, because of course, people need water for the everyday activities for everyday lives. Um, but then of course, in a city you have um, other water uses, there's industrial activities, there's agricultural activities either in or very close to the city using the same resources. Um, and then there's lots of municipal activities such as um, municipal parks, gardens, um, water that's required for firefighting, for example. So what you see is if your supply is, limit, is limiting to some degree, as your city grows and develops and these extra demands are requested, at some point you start to push the limits of, of what the traditional supplies can meet. And that's where you start to run into um, problems of people either having intermittent or uh, partially intermittent water supply, or simply not having the amount of water per person um, that's recommended by different organizations for 
decent quality of life and standard of living. Yeah, I mean, just out of curiosity, Janice, um, I suppose a lot of cities also in the global north or in more developed context also have uh, scarcity problems. If we look at the mechanism of what is causing scarcity, do we see any significant difference between the two types or two groups of cities? I don't think so, no. It's still very much this, um, if you look at London, I mean, that's... Um you know, it's a, it's in the global north. It's a western, very well developed uh, city, but it's also coming up against issues of of water supply. It's you know, it's a very big urban centre situated in a relatively dry part of the UK, if you believe that or not. <laughs> um, but the problem is just the population density is, is so high, and it's situated in a relatively p dry part of the UK. So the supplies available to it are starting to be limiting now as to the city itself and London has desalination plants in operation now to augment its supply so it's you know it's not just a problem that's in the global south by any means now not at all the thing is I don't I don't think cities like Chennai or Baira can afford desalinization um, when we look at the solution side of it right so this is a big question it's I mean it's also you know the infrastructure in cities like London or Amsterdam or, or Rotterdam we're here in the Netherlands um, those infrastructures have been developed and developing for 120 years or longer. Um, there's a financial and technical capacity there to expand and update those infrastructures and to finance new infrastructures. Desalination um, is in the example here. But you're right, a city like Baira or Chennai, firstly, the infrastructure itself might be younger. It might not be as extensive or well-developed. It might have a lot of leaks, for example. And then there's just the issue of capacity, financial, technical capacity to actually finance and then deliver um, infrastructure upgrades and extensions to meet a vastly growing population. And then, of course, you, another fundamental difference is the nature of the urbanisation. So again, Rotterdam and London are relatively well planned, they're well structured, um, whereas urban growth in, some, in rapidly developing um, sit, uh, cities you might have a lot of informal settlements um, that are using water but are not formally connected to the grid. So you've got the challenges are very different um, depending on where you look. But it's I think the challenge is global. It's just how you address the nature of our challenge is different and then how it's addressed is very different as well. Thank you. Very interesting. I'm interested in a few examples of water scarcity in specific cases in the cities. I think it would be very good for our audience to get an idea of what are the different manifestations of this common shared problem across different contexts? Yes, I mean, there's obviously there's the ongoing um, reasonably extended drought in California. So there's water rationing there. We all saw this um, a few years ago with these um, publicly available, uh, these portals on the internet that allowed residents to kind of name and shame those who were filling the swimming pools and this kind of thing. Um, there were restrictions on what you could use water for. So watering your lawn was out, for example. Um, but again, very technical approach, very top down. Um, similarly in Cape Town in South Africa with its near day zero event, where they were very close to running out of water supply for the city. And there was heavy restrictions on and water rationing, in fact, in the city there. Um, whereas in, in, for example, in Chennai, it's um, it's a lot more informal, so people will kind of informally look for off-grid water supplies, whether that's digging boreholes, um, but that just exacerbates ongoing groundwater depletion activities, for example. Um, so the approaches are very different, and again, it does come down to kind of capacity to deal with this situation. Yeah, and where do people go to, for example, when they face uh, a scarcity problem in, in general? I think the options are a bit limited. I mean, you know, you can only, a lot of, okay, a lot of people in the West at least don't move that far. So they just deal with restrictions. And we saw that in Cape Town, also in California, people didn't tend to move. Um, but again, the fundamental difference here is there was still a water supply of some description to be had. If you look at some of the severe drought events, um, particularly in, you know, East Africa, Horn of Africa, then there was fairly widespread migration whether that was internally or between nations, um, drought-driven, 
or water scarcity driven migrations where people didn't have um, sufficient water. So they simply moved to places where there was relatively more um, supply to be had. So again, I think it's, um, yeah, the, the adaptation um, activities just differ depending on where, the, on, on where you are in the context that you're, that you're situated in. Yeah, and I tend to think that water scarcity is, is sort of an onset of a chain of, of other problems to arise. Where do you see in the cases that you've been looking at um, water scarcity leading to other challenges, for example, on human well-being, on nutrition and health, on sanitation? Yeah, particularly, I mean, the, san the water supply and sanitation issue is almost one and the same. It's, uh, you almost shouldn't really talk about one without talking about the other. But you're right, I mean, um, if, we t if we look at the human development side of things, so um, a, a master's student here at IHG did some work very recently um, suggesting that there is a, a globally significant link between the supply of water and the supply of sanitation services and the growth in human development measured by the UN's HDI index, um, the Human Development Index by the UN. And that study was for 170 nations over 17 years. So it's a very robust kind of study. And what we've basically said is that um, improving sanitation and water supply coverage leads to a, statist a statistically strong um, and significant increase in the growth of the HDI of a country. Um, so basically we've said, look, if you want to improve human conditions in a country, it's not necessarily building big storage infrastructure you should focus on, it's actually investing in the supply infrastructure to deliver those resources to the people that need it. Um, but again, it, it's easier said than done. There's the whole capacity issue. In, in some countries, they just don't have either the human capacity or the financial capacity to deliver those infrastructure upgrades. In other places, in the, in the north, if you want to call it that, the challenge is also financial, but it's largely um, just the cost of doing the upgrades to, for example, making your infrastructure more efficient are hugely expensive. So it's also a financial issue, but it's a very different financial issue to what other cities may face. But there's certainly a link between um, resource demand, population growth, human well-being, um, and of course, the sanitation aspect also links to the human health, because if, uh, if your sanitation infrastructure is relatively poor, um, you're more likely to have higher incidences of, 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 um, of disease that can hamper human health and well-being. And then this has got a whole chain of knock-on effects going to local and national economic development and so on. Yeah, and, and Janes, uh, what I pick up from the interesting findings that you referred to, uh, it is better to work on the supply side and, and focus less on building dams and reservoirs and uh, water storage in general. Uh, I'm curious, why is uh, building more dams not as effective? Because if you just store the water behind the reservoir, okay, the water's there, but critically is getting that water to to people and for that you need the supply infrastructure so if you just store water for say a hydro reservoir or for irrigation or something and don't supply it to people okay it serves other purposes but we're suggesting that for human development improvements if you're going to build a dam okay but then you should also finance the supply infrastructure to deliver that water to urban areas so people have access to it um, that might mean redesigning the dam of the purpose of the dam or if there's already a reservoir in, in place perhaps you know revisiting how it's op how it's operated to allow for some of that water obviously not all of it but for some of that water to be distributed and supplied for human consumption um, to meet those development objectives so yeah I think what I think what the main message of this paper is is um, you know, perhaps it's perhaps spending a few billion on a new reservoir isn't the optimal way of doing things. Perhaps if there's already if there's already those storage solutions in place, think about distributing it rather than just adding to it. And is it safe to assume that it is cheaper to work on the delivery of the water resources than building more storage? I think it's going to be a case by case basis, depending on where you are, the size of a reservoir, the purposes of that reservoir. 
um, how many people you're distributing to. Yeah. So I don't, I, I'm not sure it's a safe assumption. Yeah. But, uh, but perhaps in the long run, in terms of the benefits, um, it might be more valuable. Since we are talking about solutions, uh, Janis, I'm curious if you could give an overview of, let's say, the most prominent solutions to work on water scarcity for urban in the global south? I think it's related to the water scarcity issue itself. You've got, you've got solutions you can look at on the supply side, but there's also important solutions on the demand side. I think there's a lot of focus on, on the supply. So expanding supply, whether it's through reservoirs or building a desalination plant. Um, there's also alternative water supply, such as rainwater harvesting, which by themselves can't, they, they might not be able to meet all the demand requirements, but they can certainly help. And I think an important message there on these alternative water supplies, um, and this goes for, for resource use and water use in general, is using a resource that's fit for the purpose for which you're using it. And by that I mean, in the case of water, for example, drinking water, quality water, should be of course used for drinking, cooking, perhaps for personal hygiene as well. But in urban areas, up to 70% of urban water use does not require drinking quality water. So this is things like washing your car or washing your windows or hosing your driveway or watering a municipal park. It needs water, but it doesn't have to come from drinking water supply. And, and here is where there's huge opportunities. Um, if you think about, say, for example, industrial processes, they require a lot of water. They require it all the time or a lot of the time, but it doesn't quite often, it doesn't need to be drinking quality water. So the opportunity there is to treat and reuse wastewater. Now people immediately think, oh, I don't want to use treated wastewater. Um, that's fine. You don't necessarily need to use it for drinking. What you can do is you can treat and reuse that wastewater for industrial applications that don't have a human contact. Um, so for machine washing in industrial processes or, um, you know, or, or, or brick manufacturing, for example. And if you have a, already a, sunny, uh, a wastewater infrastructure built in, there's a huge opportunity. These wastewater infrastructures are constantly treating and discharging treated water. It's not necessarily drinking quality water, but industrial users are quite keen to actually use that water. It's always there or it's quite reliable. It's high volume and it's also relatively cheap. And for example, there are brick manufacturers in Maputo in Mozambique who reuse treated wastewater in further brick manufacturing pro uh, process for exactly these reasons. Big volume, reliable supply, cheap. So if you think about that kind of solution, they don't need drinking quality water. So that's immediately going to hugely reduce the stress on the, on the water supply that's needed for drinking. So it's thinking about the water you need, but also how you're using that water. Do you, does it have to be drinking quality? And again, if you're washing your car, no, it doesn't. So it's being a bit more intelligent with where you're getting it from and also the sort of water you're using for the purpose. Now, this might imply a huge infrastructure change and, and, and just a, a whole change in how we do water in cities, which is another discussion altogether and also likely hugely expensive. But I think it's an increasingly important discussion to have. That's kind of a supply side. You've also got things you can do on the demand side. So demand reduction, um, how much people use um, personally during the day, are there small um, changes they can make to reduce the demand a, a little bit. Um, in Europe, we have you know in, increasingly efficient water appliances. Um, and, and what you tend to find actually is quite interesting that as the wealth of a country increases, then the amount of water used per person also increases, but only up to a point for the very richest countries in the world. So we're talking about the top few percent in terms of wealth. The water demand per capita is actually dropping, and that's le also leading to a national drop in domestic water demand. And one reason is populations are either not growing or even declining in some regions. But also the efficiency of the appliances has grown so much that if the, that efficiency gain is outstripping the low population growth. Um, so it's all about how we're using water and reducing that demand in combination with augmenting the supply, using that supply more effectively. And also looking at things like network losses, so leaks in pipes, you know, that, that can also contribute a huge amount. 
if you can close even half of those leaks again it's just it's just reducing how much you need to take out of the supply in the first place so there's a lot of options we can do um, leakages is one of the least thing that I would think of in terms of the solution. How important is this? It, it depends where you look. In some cities, it's relatively it's negligible. We're talking a few percent. But in some cities, it can be of the order 30, 40, 50 percent leakage. So if you imagine, you know, if you imagine filling a bucket and losing half before you even use it, um, that's usually inefficient. And it's a huge, essentially a waste of resource. You've taken the resource out of the supply. You filled your bucket. But when you come to use it, only half's there. If you only had to take out half in the first place, or you know, just a bit over half, there's always some loss. Um, it's just a much more efficient of your resource. So yeah, there's it, again, it depends where you are. Um, some cities are doing very well on on leakage reduction, um, but some have got huge uh, challenges to face. Um, and it's a very okay. It's a relatively easy win situation. 30 to 40 percent of the loss due to leakage is, is a lot. How can people get a grip on how much water are they losing in the system through leakage? So in our mega city um, research that we did, what we've done is we phrased the amount of leakage in how many people it, that volume could serve. And it's hundreds of millions a year of people. So we're talking, you know, another few mega cities of supply by theoretically closing all the leaks. Now, of course, that's impossible, but even if you halved that number, it would still be tens of millions. Um, so that's how we put it in context. The, the numbers are huge. Um, and again, we only analyzed a third of the mega cities. Um, so maybe putting it in that way, you know, if your city loses X amount of water, it can be, if that could potentially be diverted or used better in to supply so many extra people or for these activities. Yeah, very, very interesting. I would like to get back to the point where we discussed, you know, reusing water. Mm -hmm. That is a big portion of the equation. However, I can imagine that there are also uh, big hurdles to, uh, to surpass. For example, in agriculture, uh, people are not really willing to use wastewater. In industries, certain processes are not designed at the beginning uh, to use wastewater. Do you observe these in the cities that you've looked at and what are people actually doing to overcome these challenges in order to, you know, at the end of the day, being able to use the treated wastewater? Yeah, the biggest factor is definitely like a, um, a social one. People just don't want to use it. And we've, we did surveys on kind of acceptance of different types of alternative supplies for different types of uses and rainwater was generally favored for potable use and in the home. Wastewater reuse was basically a no. Um, with this caveat that industrial applications did favor it for the reasons I said before, it's cheap, it, it, it's, always there. it's relatively always there, it's high volume, um, depending on the industry, of course. Um, so I think the social kind of aspect of, the, of just the fact of where it's come from is a, is a huge thing. There's also legal aspects, you know, in some countries, it is, you just cannot use treated wastewater on agricultural land. You just can't do it. Um, but there's ways around. So quite often a way around that is you treat the wastewater, you pump it into a shallow groundwater um, aquifer, and then pump it back up. And then it's groundwater. It's not wastewater anymore, then it's groundwater. So it's a way of kind of getting around it in a, um, in a sense. Um, but when you look at, for example, um, Wintuk in Namibia, and most of the drinking water supply comes from treated wastewater. And it has done for 35 uh, years or more. And okay, it's driven largely by the fact that there are no other options, but it shows that technically it can be done, the water's safe, and that um, city's residents have come to accept it. And um, so I think the initial barriers are, are large. There's also, of course, a cost implication with treating water to that quality. But technologically, we can do it. Um, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if more cities start to adopt, maybe not as widespread as Windhoek, but some form of augmentation for drinking from wastewater in the next few decades, because some cities will, like Windhoek, face no other option. Um, but again, there's huge barriers. It, it, the social one, I think, is the biggest. Of course, there's cost. I don't think technology is such a barrier because we can already do it. Um, and then, yeah, there's, you know, there's infrastructure that relates to the cost it needs piping into the supply.
I very much agree because I think at some point the problem will get so pressing that you have no other option but considering these options on the portfolio. And looking at the cities, we see that a lot of cities, if not all, share this common problem or the challenge with, with dealing with water scarcity. Are they working together and trying to find solutions together or they are looking more or less within the city itself? It's a bit of both. We're all city specific um, initiatives, but there's all, there are also um, groups or consortia. So there's the Covenant of Mayors, for example, which brings together city mayors from around the world to talk about these issues. There's also the um, 100 Resilience Cities Initiative, again, brought together cities to, to discuss these issues, to look at commonalities, um, but also to look at how how that plays out locally as well. Um, so things are happening for sure. And what do you think are the added values of, you know, talking to each other and, and sharing experience? Well, you share, you share the knowledge. Um, you can share best, best practice, what did work, what didn't work. Um, of course, there's networking and collaborating opportunities. So pooling resources. Um, um, I think one thing that um, perhaps the urban sector can learn from the forestry sector is from is is looking at financing in a similar way to the, to the Red Plus initiatives, where individual projects and individual initiatives by themselves are almost too small to be picked up by the radar of big financing. It's simply too, they're not interested. It's too small to be seen. So what happens is instead of just going individually. You bring yourselves together and you form a, a consortium of projects and you pitch that for financing and then it's more attractive. So I think these are some of the lessons that can be learned, not just looking at other cities, but also at other sectors, like I mentioned with the forestry for the Red Plus, how, how they manage this approach and perhaps taking some inspiration from that mechanism and applying it to, the, to, to this issue of financing for water scarcity issues in cities, whether that's on the supply or the demand side. but approaching it in that way. Yes, I think we can wrap up the discussion here with a question on the research agenda, taking a forward-looking modality. Where do you think um, we should be focusing on in terms of the research and development for addressing water scarcity for the Global South? I think there needs to be a little bit more research into um, quantifying the impacts of climate change on resource supply to cities. I think some of that's still very uncertain. Um, also pinning down more locally urban growth um, trajectories rather than just these big statements. I think they need to be done more done locally and, and looking at how to integrate different alternative solutions, but also looking at non-engineering um, solutions. So there's a lot of work now on nature-based um, solutions, how they can contribute but also looking at kind of a psychological side behind resource use as well. And there's a lot of interesting work being done there as well. So I think there's a few kind of frontiers that need pushing out a bit. Indeed, those are some very promising new leads in terms of research and practices to address water scarcity in cities. I think this is a good moment to wrap up our conversation. Once again, thank you very much, Janice, for a very interesting conversation. I'm sure many of our audience on the Water Channel would also find this useful. I would also like to thank our audience for tuning into our podcast episode. Take care and until next time.